Now, uh, there is other kind of experiences which could be extreme and lead, which, which are, must be categorized under the environment. I'm talking here about all these studies looking at the effect on the development of children of being raised in extremely deprived psychosocial circumstances. These are children who were raised in orphanages in Romania before they were adopted in many countries. They were adopted in the UK, in Canada, in the US, and these children have been followed to look at their development. And their development has been quite uh, abnormal in many ways. Uh, Michael Rotter's group have followed a, a, a large group of them, and in, a few years ago he, he coined the term quasi-autism to describe in, an, in a high number of them uh, a number of autistic symptoms, but they were somewhat different than, than the normal variety or trajectory of autism. He found that they were, like, for instance, the improvement that the children showed between ages of four and six was much more rapid than expected. There was also they had positive features in their communication capacity and also their social approaches were much more uh, vigorous than the, in the autistic children. So he, he, he shied away of the word autism and called that quasi-autism. And now this is like a more recent uh, follow-up at age 11 where he asked the question, uh, what is the, happening to quasi-autism later? Does it persist? Uh, if there is an improvement in, uh, let's say, cognition, uh, does it disappear? And basically what he concluded that uh, is that uh, it stays. It stays in some of them, so there are still 9.2% of the children who do have an ASD uh, diagnosis or quasi-autism, um, and that is, um, and there is also another group which is like sub-threshold has autistic features but not the quasi-autism per se. Quasi-autism is associated with lower IQ, although ma many of them have IQ in the normal range, poor theory of mind scores, and uh, the quite remarkably, which is more, int more interesting, is that uh, this quasi-autism uh, persistence seems to be applying to children who were staying in orphanages over the age of six months. So they, they were, the, the longer they stay, the more likely they are to be in the quasi-autism group. And some of the quasi-autism uh, subjects improved, a uh, quarter of them improved very much at age 11, but then displayed much more uh, uh, be behavioral problems of the type usually seen in children raised in institutions. But the point is that it provides a template for a very extreme early uh, uh, situation for uh, raising children which might lead to autistic syndrome, symptoms, quasi-autism, sub-threshold, uh, something. But that is important because it seems to be uh, having its own momentum, borrow autistic features, but be somewhat different than similar. So the mechanism uh, are, would be very interesting to me. Uh, then, am, 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 I, am I okay with time? I'm a bit too, no? No. Okay, I'm going, I'm going quick. Okay. Uh, okay, um, in terms of, now, the, the, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm almost finished, I think. Um, in parental age is the most intriguing uh, variable which has been looked at. And I present it now, but I'm not, uh, I'm not pretending that parental age is a, an environmental risk factor or psychosocial variable. Because parental age could be a proxy for different things, including genetic mechanisms. So uh, we need to, to keep that in mind. But the, the idea that these are based on US data, um, uh, there are change in the family sort of patterns of life. Uh, now, for instance, we look at, at this data, maternal age has increased in, in the US for, uh, by four years between 17 uh, to 2004. There is no, no proportion of birth now uh, with mothers over the age of 35. Now it's 14% of them compared to 5%. And fertility rates have also increased in older men compared to younger men. And family size has decreased. So it, there is a, a bunch of converging trends which might actually raise the question that they might actually contribute to the trends that we have seen in autism prevalence. Um, and a number of studies have actually provided uh, an association between the risk of autism and, and increased parental age, either paternal or maternal. I picked up this study which was published this year because it's actually the best, probably, uh, to look at simultaneously at the joint effect, uh, the combined effect of a, an older mother and an older father. 
And for that, they needed a huge sample size because there is obviously a, a large correlation between paternal age and maternal age. So if you want to tease apart what does what, you need a huge sample size. So they had 5 million subjects and 12,000 cases in that study. And that's why they could do things that could not be done uh, before. And uh, to cut the story short, they, if you look at this, uh, that's comparing uh, the risk for mothers. So this is uh, the, to express that the, the risk of mothers to have a child with an ASD is 51% more compared to that of mothers which are, who are between 25 and 29 years of age. So it's a very substantial increase. For fathers, it's about 36% if you are over 40 compared to uh, 25 and 29. Substantial uh, 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 things. And that's been, uh, it's very in line with other studies done by Durkin using CDC data. And, uh, so I, I think that there is convergence and replication. Uh, and then what they could do is look at the joint effects. So because they had so many uh, subjects, they could split their sample by different fathers' age groups. So this is, for instance, the, 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 the story for uh, <clears throat> fathers who are under 25. So you could see this is the effect of being a young mother, uh, a young mother, a less young mother, and an older mother. You can see that this is the risk for the maternal age increased steeply, and then controlling for the father's age, which is the same. And the same here. Because these are for fathers who are 35 to 39. If the mother is young, the risk is low. If the mother is older, the risk increases. So you can see all these slopes tells you that the risk increases as a function of maternal age, whereas there is no change in, the, in the father's age. So that's a very uh, important uh, uh, study. And then they also estimated that over 10 years, it could be as well that uh, 4 or 5% of the increase in the autism caseload in the data set could be due to these factors. Right? So it's not, it's not insignificant, and this is actually not even taking into account the effect of increased paternal age. Um, so the finding, as I said before, I may uh, keep that for discussion, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, it's, it's bad and we don't know the mechanism. It could be that, that there are more mutations including in the, uh, occurring in the germ cells in the fathers as the age that has been shown independently. So there could be just a, 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 an issue of more mutation occurring with age. It could be that there are epi epigenetic changes. Epigenetic changes have been actually shown in, in mice. So there, are, there is a, an ongoing study where uh, someone has developed a, an old mice, which is like fathering children. So they, they are like doing uh, this, this repeat uh, uh, thing, so they can look at what's, what is transmitted from these old fathers to the offspring, and the offspring show bad behaviors as well uh, in the mice, and they, they've looked, in fact, it seems that the fathers, the older father, transmit their DNA, not change, but there is epigenetic changes, which seem to be the mechanism. So it's very interesting to me. But there could be also other, other mechanisms in terms of environmental neurotoxicants and different things. So we, we, need to, we need to unpack this association, which is now very robust, into, and tease out uh, competing mechanisms uh, to see what, uh, what it means. But that's an probably uh, uh, strong thing. So to summarize, uh, I'm, I'm finishing. Uh, you know, I said the, the genetic studies have been disappointing. In some ways, I would say the environmental studies have been disappointing as well. Because when you, when you try to make sense of all that, we don't know much about mechanisms. We don't know how much of the proportion of autism uh, seems to be explained by these environmental factors. A lot of things are very, uh, very uh, uh, eccentric, or, or the exposures are historical, like congenital rubella, or so rare, like for mesoprostol thalidomide, that what we know from them is cannot explain more than a tiny fraction of cases. So it is disappointing in some ways. Uh, and there are multiple uh, method issues that need to be addressed. Uh, I will uh, skip that for the sake of time. Um, we don't learn, we have not learned much about mechanisms so far in these studies. And I, I think it's worth pointing that the best things that we have learned have arose from uh, large scale population-based studies where people had enough power to look at uh, the joint effects of various exposure, which tend to be often uh, uh, highly uh, correlated. Um, 
Okay, so now I just want to, there are two slides and I will be finishing. Uh, it's just to say that these studies of the environmental risk factors in my view finally has just started now. And there is a bunch of studies here which are listed, which are ongoing or about to start. And, we are, and they all come back to the beginning of the pregnancy. So these investigators will look at children's outcome, including autism and other things, but they will start early in the pregnancy. So they will be able to measure exposure in the home environment to various toxins at a time where it matters, not after the facts. So they are doing that in various studies, and this will be uh, very informative in the years to come. Um, there has been also uh, last spring a first attempt to uh, put together in the same room uh, people who are interested in that and uh, Autism Speaks and NIEHS uh, are uh, committed to uh, fund a network of investigators who are looking at ASD in relation to environmental risk factors. So it sta starts to happen there will be uh, more contact between different teams, more uh, sharing of protocols, and that's good. Too. So that's, I think, is a good news because it's, it shows that it, the, the field will probably go in the right direction. I'm going to stop here and keep and ask you to keep an eye always on the evidence. Okay.